Doctor, thank you for coming to today's event. It's a very um, special privilege to host Dr. Um, Amlan Mitra. This event is part of our One Book, One College program on the musical Hamilton. And you may not know this, but Alexander Hamilton was instrumental in starting our financial, economic, and banking systems in the United States. And it, there's a lot of people that have been involved over two centuries, but he built the foundation that made us into the finance kind of you know powerhouse of the world right now. And um, I think he deserves a lot of credit with that. And also, it's amazing to me how little we often know about our own banking system. I go to the ATM, I get some money, I use my debit card, it works. And there's a lot of reasons why and a lot of people behind the scenes that make it work. So it's good for us to understand that. And Dr. Mitra is going to um, help us do that today. Let me give you a quick um, biography of our um, guest lecturer, and then I will get out of the way and we will go. Dr. Mitra is a professor of economics at Purdue University Northwest. He serves on the Transportation Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences at Washington, DC. He also serves on various editorial boards of economics and business journals. He's published numerous articles in peer-reviewed business and economics um, publications. His research focuses on economic impact analysis and public policies, with special focus on regional economic development. His most recent research, funded by the US Department of Transportation, examined the economic impacts of disruptions in freight transportation due to the 2008 flood in Northwest Indiana. Some of his past research projects have been funded by the US Environmental Protection Agency, US Department of Energy, Illinois Department of Education, Indiana Workforce Development. He was the recipient of the second annual Chancellor's Distinguished Faculty Lecture Award. Um, it is a nice privilege to have such a distinguished scholar to share his ideas with us. Um, I want to thank the Social Action Club and the International Women's Club for sponsoring this event, and especially say thanks to Annette De Silva, who's one of our economics faculty members, for organizing and helping to promote um, today's talk. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Mitra. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all of you. Yes, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, thanks to Professor De Silva and uh, Troy Swanson. I would like to also thank the social action program that you have here. Uh, it's beautiful campus. Uh, this is my first time here. So uh, let me start uh, with this. If you look at the topic, the topic talks about the challenges to the US banking and financial system. What would Hamilton do? Now, uh, in order to understand what would Hamilton do, first of all, we need to understand about the fi banking and the financial system. So how many of you actually know about Federal Reserve? What is Federal Reserve? It's the main bank, right? right? It's the main bank of the United States. And what does Federal Reserve do, actually? Does anyone know? Forget about the Federal Reserve. Let's look at our economy right now. How many of you know how much we produce? Any idea? Do you know how much debt we have? About? Oh, very good. So you have done your homework. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, so yeah, we have about 19 trillion uh, 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 dollar in debt, actually. And our GDP is about 17 trillion dollars. So what does that mean? That means our national debt is more than our GDP, like about 105%. Now, what is the difference between national debt and deficit? How many of you know that? Do you know the difference between deficit and debt? Anybody? I'm asking too many questions, but I want you to get involved, right? Yes. I think deficit is when you import more than you export, and debt is with how much you owe. Okay, now I think you are talking about the trade deficit, which is, uh, which is also a type of deficit, but I'm talking about the federal deficit. If you think about the federal deficit, it's like, let's say on a monthly basis, how much is your spending and how much is your income? If you look at the difference between the spending and the income, 
that is your deficit on a monthly basis. So similarly, if you look at the country's deficit, then you can look at at a quarterly level or you can also look at at a yearly level. What is the total expenditure and what is the total revenue? The revenue comes from taxes, right? So the federal deficit is measured on a annual year, let's say, or on a monthly basis and it's about $375 billion. But the accumulation of this deficit, so time when there is a, a deficit in a federal budget, then it keeps on accumulating over the years. And right now, we have this $19 trillion as the accumulated uh, debt. And this debt, by the way, is our also own debt, which means that if you have any debt with your credit cards, right? Those are also included. So our country is actually having a huge national debt, which is very similar to what Hamilton actually faced during the Revolutionary War, right? There was huge debt in the states. And what he did, what he proposed, we will talk a little bit of, of those things here. How is this, the current situation, how is it kind of similar to at that time, even though at that time the debt was about $75 billion, which is nothing. $75 billion or it may be a million, I don't know, but it's very little, okay? And uh, Hamilton actually proposed uh, that we need to do something about it, okay? So there are questions about what happened during the 2008 and 2009 crisis, like the bailout, right? Have you heard of the bailout, right? So that bailout was questioned. So we will look into some of these issues, but we'll also look into, for example, what is the banking system, okay? We need to know about the bank. Why, how does money matter? Runs the world. Huh? Runs the world. Runs the world, that's a very good answer, okay? So anyway, we will look into uh, those kind of things. We will talk a little bit about, should you take a loan? What type of loan should you take? How many of you have student loans? <laughs> None of you here, really? So do you have all scholarships? So there are like different types of loans, different types of ways to finance, right? Then also it comes to how do you spend smartly? These are very, the very important things for our for our college students and we do at Purdue, we talk about uh, uh, this in a personal finance class, I don't know which we, we have it here or not, where we just focus on the uh, individual finances and so on. See, the thing is that the way I teach in a classroom, that's the way I would like to present my things so that it's not boring because I can give a lecture. Do you like to just want me to speak one-sided? Communication is not one-sided, right? Right? It has to be interactive and you will enjoy more, right? Some of you are here because you are forced, right? Did you have a choice? By the way, economics is about choices. How many of you chose to be here? And rest are forced or extra credit? <laughs> extra credit. <laughs> so anyway, you made the choice of getting the extra credit, right? So everything we do is about choices. The country that uh, right now in a situation, we have to make good choices. It is not about the policy makers. It's also about citizens. We have to be informed citizens. So if you know more about finances, then you will not make the same mistakes at the, uh, like the other people who have done. How many banks failed, right? Why? Knowingly sometimes, sometimes unknowingly, not knowing, okay? So we will talk a little bit of all these things, okay? And uh, it'll be good for you to also ask questions. It'll be also good that, uh, you know, if you have some solution, we can talk about these things towards the end, okay? So let's, let's uh, look at a video clip that I think you will enjoy. But anyway, so just to have a little bit understanding about Hamilton, he was the first Secretary of Treasury. 
okay? and he belonged to the Federalist Party. He believed in very strong government. Okay? Uh, think about it right now, we are in a situation where we have uh, the political parties uh, talking about whether there should be more or less intervention uh, with regard to uh, the free market, right? So he actually developed an economic plan and uh, talking about how we should uh, subsidize the domestic industries so that they can do better, how we can protect our domestic producers by imposing a tariff. Do you know what a tariff is? Tariff is nothing but a tax on the imports. Okay, tax on the imported goods. So he was talking about that. He was talking about establishment of, na of a national bank, pay all the debts. According to him, actually, he believed that if the federal government assumes all the state debts, then it will look good, actually. It will give more credibility. And he believed that, you know, if, if the federal government is taking that responsibility of debt, then they will be even more more careful, okay, to pay off the debts. So think about a lender and a borrower, right? Right. So if the lender thinks that the borrower will be more careful, more more responsible about the debt, then they will lend money, right? So and they should be, okay. So that was the idea behind creating a national bank. But right now, by the way, I'm not trying to compare the situation right now uh, with what happened then. Okay, there are a few things that we will discuss later on that uh, Hamilton will do the, exactly the same things that we have done, but there are other things. Right now, Hamilton will not be very happy with the national debt right now. I mean, he's not going to be very happy with that because it does have an impact on the future generations, right? So he believed in debt. Companies take, borrow money, right? Deficit financing, but you have to be responsible. Right? So that is the, something that we should, we should think about, that if a country is borrowing money, that is not necessarily a bad thing, but for what purposes, how do we reallocate the resources, where are we spending the money? And this can be applied to our own individual decisions also. Okay? So that is something that we have to be very careful. So he mentioned about how it will be an economic advantage to have a national bank that it will provide loans, the, the, the government can handle the funds. At that time, there was no way for the government, somebody to account for what is going in, what is coming. There were no tax collections at that time. So there was no institution to provide that. And Hamilton basically said that, you know, why it's so important. So why, why do you think banks are important? Does anyone know why you think the banks are important? So I have some additional videos, but let me let me share with you. How many of you know why some people keep a large amount of money at home? Anyone? I used to hear when I first met my wife that my father-in-law keeps money under the mattress. And I was shocked, being an economist. So some people do, they keep money at home. Does anyone know? Why? Yes. Is they're to put it in the bank? It's, it's free? No, they're scared to put it Oh, they're scared to put the money in the bank. Why they're scared? Okay, so there are some misperceptions that we will, uh, we will talk about. Uh, these days, most of the banks are insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. For each depositor, it's insured up to $250,000. That's a lot of money. Many people don't know that. Okay, we need to sometimes hold cash, but cash, you know, can be obtained through ATMs, right? Can be obtained by writing a check. So it's not that difficult, okay? So the reason uh, uh, why it's not a good idea to have a huge sum of money at home is that you could have invested that money and got some good return. Now you will say, well, look at the banks. How much do they 
give interest, right? These days, the savings account and even the certificate of deposits, which are different types of instruments, uh, very little interest, right? So we will talk a little bit about uh, these things towards the end. I know that there's a lot to talk about this topic. I mean, there is an entire course about money and banking that we uh, uh, talk about, okay? But can somebody tell me, could you use money to produce a product similar to a factory or a machine? Is money a productive resource? What do you think? If I give you some dollar bills, can you make something? Yeah. No. So money is actually not a productive resource. In economics, we consider money to be a medium of exchange, and it has some other functions. Okay. So when we look at the functions of money, we know that it can be used as a unit of account, right? You know that the, uh, if you go to a store looking at a product, how much the price is. So looking at the price, you know how much the value is. It can be a store of value, right? People hold money to postpone their transactions, right? They need money for precautionary reasons. But you cannot, you cannot produce with money. So money is a financial resource. It's an accounting capital. But it's not capital in the sense of factories, machineries, and buildings. Does that make sense to you? You probably know, right? You have learned that at least in the very first day of your economics class. Okay? So sometimes people make mistake about money. Okay? So, uh, but is lack of money a big deal? Yes. It is a big deal because we can buy a lot of things with money. And think about Without money, people bought. There was bought or exchange, right? So the reason why we need to have some institutions to facilitate the transaction is very important. So here we have Ivana. Okay, I made up this name not for any other reason, but since Ivana is the inventor. So I wanted to have I for I, okay? So Ivana is the inventor, and Walter is the widower, okay? So Ivana designed a, a low-cost robot that cleans house, even does windows, okay? <laughs> Washes cars, mows the lawn, and clean a lot of other things. But she has no money, no funds to put her wonderful invention into, into production. Walter, the widower, has accumulated a lot of savings over the years. Okay? Now think of this. If we could get these two individuals together, then we could see light of the day. We could have shinier cars, clean houses, good neighborhoods, so here is a situation where somebody who has money can help an, another individual who needs money to produce. Now, without a bank, Ivana has to look for Walter. So for a barter exchange, you have to have the buyer and the seller look for each other so that there is a match. But instead, if we have an institution like bank, then bank then help to facilitate the exchange. Because there is a lot of transaction cost involved from an individual's point of view to find the other individual who will make an exchange. So these are the reasons actually when we think of banks and firms, they came. They came because of these reasons. Okay. So we need to understand that. That's one reason why we have banks, so that there is an exchange of funds from the lenders to the borrowers. And it can be put use into a lot of good things. So if you look at the structure of our financial system, there are two ways of financing. One is a direct finance, which is done through the financial markets. These are examples of the financial markets. Does anyone know 
what is a stock market? You probably know, right? So there is a buying and selling of stocks. Then money markets. We have money markets which are dealing with transactions of money after a certain amount, obviously. We have commodity markets, insurance market, futures markets. Now these are different types of markets that we talk about in a, in a typical money banking class, okay? But we don't have the time. But as you know, that we should know that there are different types of financial assets that can be exchanged, okay? And that they are the people who also can help in the borrowing. But then we have this financial intermediaries. These financial intermediaries include commercial banks, savings bank, credit unions, and those kind of things. Does anyone know what's the difference between a bank and a credit union? No one? Have you, have you, have you seen a credit union? Is there a credit union in Palos Hills? Okay, credit unions sometimes are very good. Actually, uh, we will talk, we'll get into this slide, but let me tell you that credit unions sometimes can be very good in terms of uh, putting money there. Credit unions are run by members within a community. They try to serve the interest of the community. They are not for profit, unlike the banks. Okay, so if they make some profits, it goes back to the members. So sometimes when you're thinking of borrowing money, credit unions will be very good actually. They usually give you at a lower rate compared to a bank. Okay, so there are some of the advantages of credit unions. They are very small though, okay, and they are within a, within a community. So th there's a difference between then banks and credit unions. So anyway, to talk about the financial markets and the financial intermediaries, you could see that they are there to facilitate the exchange of financial assets. We did talk a little bit about banks and the credit unions. And uh, does anyone know when we say banks make money, how do they make money? What do they do? Yes. Yes, very good, by giving out loans. So they take our money that we save, and then that money is then loaned to other people at a higher interest rate. So think about it, when we put money in the savings account, how much the banks are paying us? Nothing. These days, the savings rate is very low, partly because our interest rates are very low. Okay, so the interest rates are set by whom? Who, who is the, which bank sets the interest rate? There are different types of interest rates also. Do you know that? Right? There is an interest rate by which banks borrow from each other. There is interest rate that the Federal Reserve, which is the chief bank, let banks borrow from them. So it's called discount rate. Then we have the federal funds rate where the banks are borrowing money from each other. Okay. And then we have prime rate, we have loan rates, right? There are mortgage rates, right? Different types of interest rates. But they are, to, to a large extent, they depend on the demand and supply of different types of uh, financial assets and stuff, right? So th those are the things that it's good to know. Right now, I don't know if you are going to buy a house, but at least right now, you are going through your college years, there are a lot of expenses, you need to buy a car, right? And when it comes to these type of decision, decision making, then interest rate does matter. You know, oftentimes students will say, well, my parents are going to pay. Well, for the time being maybe, but there will be a time when you need to know that. I have two kids who are in college when my first son bought his first car, and he wanted to buy a BMW, by the way. And I told him that's not a good idea. No, he wants to show off. Sorry, he's not hearing, but if it is on YouTube, he will be, sorry. <laughs> but he didn't have any idea about how, you know, that they wanted to look at his credit history to give him a loan. No idea. He couldn't afford it. So these type of situations 
sometimes you don't realize but you need to be apprehensive of these type of things that's the reason why it's so important to know about money okay so anyway so uh, this is just to let you know that putting money in a bank is definitely a safe thing but we will go beyond that here we'll talk about how we can get a higher return what are the different options that are available also a few things that is very important when you consider choosing a bank there are different types of accounts okay one of the things that i always tell my students is that you know make sure that there is no maintenance fee you know why would you pay a maintenance fee as a student putting money in a bank there are a lot of banks that will not require any fees at all that will not require any minimum balance we need to think about those things you need to have easy access these days you guys don't want to go to a bank you want to go to a drive through atm machine right now i just saw my son's account which is very much linked with my account and saw that he went to withdraw money in two different banks on the same day with a atm fee of $2.50 he is at purdue he is a chemical engineer what can i tell him i'm using my family example i'm an economist right so 250 for withdrawing 10 dollars but we do make mistakes like that i don't but people do you don't care okay so sometimes the banks will ask you hey why don't you have an overdraft protection because you don't have enough money to us just to make sure that well that's a monthly fee of ten dollars or twenty five dollars why do you need an overdraft protection if you are very careful about your expenses so there are things that you can take control of your own finances and not pay these additional fees that are imposed on you when you open an account these are very very important okay so uh, what I would like to say is that uh, yes putting money in the bank is good savings account and other types of accounts are good but we also need to think at this age I didn't do it by the way but I am I am uh, uh, advising you that if you have even fifty dollars a month you need to set it away you need to find a way to invest that and it builds up within within five years that's not you know very long time and sometimes we don't understand that okay but there are also other types of investment that I would say that you should not you should not be engaging in and I have seen how some students like have lost a lot of money by investing in uh, stocks that have very high volatility doing day trading have you heard of day tra trading very bad very bad okay so what we should do is we need to find out a way to at least put money into right use one of the important thing also is that we need to understand between credit and debit cards okay some people say that you know it's uh, it's not a good idea to use a credit card which which may be true but it's not necessarily true if you had the choice of using a credit card or paying cash how many of you would be using the credit card why can you tell me why huh you hate to carry cash okay no but you can use a debit card right what is the reason yes very good that's a very smart answer that's a very smart answer just what she said what is very important is to build a credit history and credit history doesn't mean that you have to borrow so much money credit history can be at least you are showing some responsibility that whatever money you owe you are paying it so let's say if you make you know transactions with credit card about hundred dollars a month 
and you pay it off. You don't have to pay even any interest. Okay. So if somebody tells you that uh, don't use the credit card, the only reason they might say is that there is sometimes when you have the credit card, you have this impulse of spending and that is not good. But if you're responsible, it increases your cash flow, right? If you use the credit card, it, it also increases your cash flow. But don't be like our government. Don't be like some of the companies that went bankrupt. We have to be responsible. And as she said, it's very, very important that we need to have a credit history. Okay. So why do you think that there are some businesses, uh, uh, not some businesses actually, these days, most of the businesses, they accept the credit cards. Only very small, you know, even mom and pop store these days uh, accept credit cards because it's very easy. They don't have to keep track in writing about all the debits and the credits transactions. Okay, so it makes it very, very useful also. I know that there are uh, uh, some poor countries, there are businesses where they, they don't trust People sometimes don't trust. They might think, oh, if the banks fail, what, what will happen? What will happen uh, if, I, if I borrow something and I, and I... So you have to be careful about your, your finances. And I think that is very important. Businesses also sometimes apply for lines of credit. I don't know if you know what is that, but it gives the business an amount that they can use for day-to-day -day expenses. So these are the different types of instruments that we have in the banks. If you, some of you, how many of you would like to be an entrepreneur? Anybody here would like to run your own business? Good, what type of business do you like to have? Okay, but you need some capital, right? Okay, and when we say capital, we don't, here we are talking about financial capital by which you can buy, you know, equipments and whatever you need to use it. And, you know, you might think, you know, sometimes to get a loan or even to get a line of credit. A line of credit comes with sometimes a cheaper, a lower interest rates, okay? Should you take a loan? What type of loan should you take? Should you take a loan from the bank? depending on what type of loan and how you're going to use the loan for your education expenses. How many of you, oh, you, most of you didn't say that you didn't take loan, right? Okay, but most of our students at Purdue, they take federally subsidized loan at a very low interest rate, which they have to pay back once they graduate, okay? So in those type of situations, if somebody is taking a loan from a bank, which is about 15 to 20% interest rate compared to the federal loan, which is maybe 2 or 3%. Right now, the interest rates are very low, very low. The federal funds rate and the discount rates are 1 and 1.5%. Think about it. Compared to the prime rate, which is 4%. Right? So we have to be very knowledgeable about these type of decisions. Sometimes, you know, students say they don't know about loans because their parents have applied for those loans, which I did too. <laughs> you know, but we need to find out about different types of uh, loans that are available. If you have to take a loan, what are the processes and those kind of things. Very, very important. There are a lot of risks. We need to, we cannot just talk about how good it is to invest, but we need to talk about what are the different types of investments, what are the different types of risks, okay? So when you think of investment, you know, investment in the sense that you'll be putting money to get a return, okay? There are these different types of investments. And depending on the type of risk, you could see higher risks means higher returns. Students like you should not be even going above this pyramid. So what are the different types? Can you all see this? It's a savings account, which I won't recommend. 
Money market also, I won't recommend. CDs may be not bad if you can, you know, uh, have CDs. But one of the things that I would say is very good for students like you, if you can set aside $50 or $100 a month, is mutual funds. Why mutual funds? Why mutual funds? And I say conservative mutual funds. You can get a lot of this information uh, uh, through the internet about different types of mutual funds, companies, because the risk in mutual funds are diversified. Because they have stocks, bonds, different types of portfolios of different levels of risk. Right? So if, if one stock is not doing well, it can be it will be compensated by something else that is doing. So the overall, the average return, much, you know, uh, I would say, uh, much less uncertainty involved. Okay, but typically, you know, you will see that most of the mutual funds have a return of how much do you think, compared to savings account of one percent? How much do you think? Let's say on a ten-year period, if you put money. Okay, in mutual fund, what is the average return, do you think? 10%, very good. Who said that? Very good, excellent. 10%. Okay, so think about it. 10% on a 10-year. Most of you are, you know, 18, 19, 20. By the age of 30, 10% and not doing anything or putting money in the bank is not going to help. Okay, but I'm not saying it's easy to uh, find good mutual funds, but you guys can do that. You have a lot of financial advisors in every campus. You can talk to people, you can do your own research, you can talk to your faculty if you have interest, but start saving now. Our savings, we are, you know, big spenders in, in this country, right? How much do we spend out of your total income? Any idea? How much cons consumers spend? Out of a dollar? How much do you think is the marginal propensity to consume? <laughs> it has been studied. For every dollar change, how much do we consume? Close to 90%. There was a time when we had negative savings rate. Now we are doing a little bit better, but very little. Think about, if we don't save, where will we get money to invest? Right? Where will the investment come? Yes? What's good about CDs? Or CD investments? Yeah, CD is a certificate of deposit where it requires you to put a certain amount of money. There are some minimum requirements. And then it will say, well, if it is a six month CD or if it is a one year CD, depending on your, um, uh, you know, uh, how much you need the money, when you need the money. So you can make the longer you put the money set aside, the higher is the interest rate. Is that those credits? Yes, yeah. yes. You know, it does because even your checking and savings account builds credit. Mm -hmm. Just to have an account. So you would recommend opening up a CD? Definitely, definitely. But, but you know, you have to do good shopping, you know, because not that all banks give the same interest rates. So you need to think about that, and that's the reason I mentioned about small banks, okay? Credit unions sometimes can, but you have to become a member to do that, okay? And this is what I was, I was, I was saying that if you look at, this is a study, by the way, done by Gallup, uh, you know, uh, survey company. We are not doing a good job in terms of investment. This is the percentage of US adults that are invested in the stock market. There was a time during 2000 and uh, uh, before the financial crisis, it was pretty high. 55%, I mean, do you, you might think that it's a good number. 55%, half of the adults are not investing. Okay. There are so many different ways that we, uh, uh, that we spend money, okay? but we always forget 
and I am telling you, I mean, uh, I, uh, uh, I would say being an economist also, uh, you know, later on maybe I realized, but I didn't, you know, saving was something that I didn't think of. So based on my lesson, I can tell you that you, some of you should think about it, most, most of you. I mean, I understand for those of you who may not have enough to do things, but think about this after some years at least when you have a when you have a job one of the thing about you know doing college and i will talk a little bit about this later on um, about trying to find some ways to earn money okay working flexible hours it's very important okay but i'm not saying don't take the full load of classes that's very important too and you can do both you know i may be lecturing here because I never, uh, 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 I'm from India and I did my college education. Uh, I was not working or anything. But this country is different. Here, most of you have to work. You know, how many of you work actually? See, that's the reason probably you don't have to take loan. That shows, which is good. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. And that is the good thing about a community college, you know. I love teaching in a community college. I do that some time to time. Different types of students, much more serious. So look at this attendance, I'm impressed. Am I making any sense? <laughs> well, uh, we have limited time and uh, I, I just wanted to. Uh, so uh, should we invest? Should we invest in stocks? Should we invest in bonds? We can ask all these type of questions. I think I mentioned to you that it's a good thing to invest in, um, in, in mutual funds because it's much lower risk compared to certain types of stocks and uh, other risky investments. Don't go there. I know students love this, trading currencies. There are a lot of risks involved different types of risk if you think of transaction risk by the time you you bought the uh, uh, you know share whatever the currency you know and the, by the time the transaction ends the value may change so even during the process of the transaction the value may change that's not good that's not good for anybody okay so we need to keep those things in in mind okay we need to also understand about capital gains and losses. Here I have given a simple example, two different time periods. You bought the uh, uh, shares and then how much you sold at and then the difference. So capital gains and losses is also good to understand, especially if you, so whenever you start thinking about investing in the, in the, in the financial market, uh, then you need to have some understanding of these things, which are very important, you know. There are people I have seen that are, um, you know, filing, will be filing, the deadline is when? April 15th, right? And if you don't make a good decision, so if you don't know what's going on with your capital gains and losses, you will not be able to use the tax tool to even pay the right amount of taxes. You may be overpaying. If you have a loss, you can. If you have a gain, obviously you should report. So these are very important things. Okay, how many of you have, will have filed taxes or will be filing taxes? Yeah, good. It's good to file a tax. Sometimes students say, "Well, my income is not that much." I that also creates some type of credit history too. Okay, that you have been responsible. Okay. I wish I had time to uh, talk about this, the housing market and the financial crisis a lot. But uh, just let me ask you, how many of you know, like a, a kind of a sketchy thing about what happened? How many of you know? Okay, can you share, one of you, can you share if you don't mind? Is there a mic there? That would be nice. I would like to know because it's good to hear this from a student. Yes.
I have given some information also here, so feel free to use that. But tell me a little bit briefly, like as if you are talking to a lay person, what happened? The housing market, um, well, the banks were giving out mortgage loans to basically anyone, and uh, CDLs were just like a bunch of mortgages piled together into one place, and people weren't paying back the mortgages; they were just leaving the houses. Why couldn't they pay back? Because I mean, a lot of people didn't even have jobs or anything. That is one reason, but also the interest rate changed they, yeah, they because they were initially given a very low interest just so that they could afford a house, okay? And then those who are investors bought these mortgage-backed securities and they were even insured by companies like AIG. So if you have an insurance, then it's less risky, then you buy even more. And there was, sorry to inter uh, uh, interrupt. So then what happened? So, then, so the banking... So and then the banks started closing. Yes, started, you know. Now the question is, some of these banks, the first bank that started to collapse was the Lehman Brothers, right? Lehman Brothers, you have heard. And then also other banks like Chase and Credit City Group and all those banks, you know. So that was the reason for the bank failure. And because of that, there was a bailout, right? So if Hamilton was here, definitely he would he would, uh, uh, you know, support this bailout. But he would also say, well, what do we do next? So the bailout actually was not bad. I don't know if anyone believes that the bailout was bad. It has, you know, it's like almost eight years now, nine years now. These banks are doing very good. These banks now have tremendous amount of cash. The major problem right now, you know, is that they are not feeling safe to lend the money. Now they are very cautious. So think about the role of the Federal Reserve, the role of the Department of Treasury. They have to find ways to make sure that these things don't happen. That's the reason we have regulations, bank regulations and those kind of things. So there were times when there were not enough regulations. There were times that there were too much regulations. So we need to think about that too, Inter intervention of the government. You know, I know there are a lot of us who think that, you know, the government should not be, you know, uh, 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 interfering in our lives, which is true. But we don't have a free market system like we think. Do you think we have a free market system for all products? No. No. Is there any incentive for the private sector to build roads and national defense? To provide education fully? No. So there are reasons why we, in economics we talk about why is it necessary to have this intervention. And Hamilton actually believed in that. You know, believed in that. The Federalist Party, you know, coming from, from that perspective, he believed in a stronger government that could actually be good for the people. So when the government is actually doing something good, then it should not be bad. Why? Okay. But our budget debt that we have, the, the national debt and the budget deficit, and if we want to spend more, think about how much the debt we have accumulated because of 9-11, right? We are spending a lot of money in, you know, fighting in, 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 in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and now we are thinking about interfering in, in Syria. So the defense spending will be going up. So where will the money come from? I'm giving a little bit of perspective of our economy. We need to understand that. How should it be reallocated? If you are increasing defense spending, there has to be a way to fund the resources, right? During Hamilton's time, there was no way for the government to collect taxes. Now at least we have that. But we don't want that. When I say we don't want that, I mean that's not happening, right? That we raise our taxes. In general, taxes are not good. I understand that. But how do we, how do, we do these good things? Without, uh, without collecting any revenue. There's no such thing as free lunch in economics, you know that, right? There is always a trade-off to give up 
you have to give up something to get something that's something that you have to remember okay so i know it's it's about time to wrap it up so there are few things that i would like you to uh, at least keep in mind these are things that are not something that you may not know but it's good that we need to uh, 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 you know do some good money management as well as time management okay very basic stuff like i don't know if if this one you know some of you might laugh at this but this can have a huge impact if the students decide to share rides especially those who are coming from the same locality if you believe that this is if you think that this is, has nothing to do with our economy then you are crazy energy prices right now again the gas prices are going up how much money do you know how much money i spend in in gas i live in naperville and my campus is in Hammond, Indiana, Purdue Northwest campus. I used to have a Honda Pilot. And you know how much that consumes. It took time. In microeconomics, you're learning about elasticity. Have you gone there yet? How we respond to the changes in price? One of, what is one of the factors that affects our responsiveness? Time. It took me a few years to change from a pilot to a hybrid. <laughs> I'm so happy now. I don't spend as much money in gases. And I wish I did. But the price of hybrids initially was very high. Right? So here, if this is good for the economy, what should the role of the government be? To provide incentives for people to produce more hybrids, to consume more hybrids, Related, very much related. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, my my question to you is this: How many of you buy lottery tickets? Good, good. I used to buy those time. So what will you do, sir? You said just do it, right? Okay, can you, can you mention a few things that may come out of my lecture so far that you could use? What would you do? What is the very first thing that you should do? Those kind of things? Stop spending money on lottery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and if you win a lottery, let's, let's assume that, okay. that you have won. Okay. Then what do you do? <laughs> okay, yes, invest, okay, yes, thank you, thank you, for at least, I'm glad that at least I heard, that is good, invest too, cash out, I'm not saying that you shouldn't enjoy, you know, drink as much beer you want, okay, get drunk, but get a financial team get some advice and pay off your debts don't change your behavior right away okay don't change your behavior just because you have so much money there are people who have won lottery tickets they are right now below poverty you can get information on the internet people who have won not only lottery tickets, people who have made huge, or Donald Trump would say, right? Huge money. They have lost everything because bad money management. So that is something that you should take away from, from I hope, from this, this presentation. Okay. Any other question? Other questions? Thank you, thank you so much.